Hello. Sharkalil, the subversion of Christianity. This is part five of that series. And here Allah gets to what he considers to be the heart of the problem. If we grant that what the New Testament means by Christianity and being a Christian merely conforms to human ideas and pleases and flatters us as though it were all our own invention and teaching springing up from within ourselves, then there is no problem. There is, however, a but, a difficulty for what the New Testament really means by being a Christian is the very opposite of what is natural to us. It is thus a scandal. We have either to revolt against it or at all costs to find cunning ways of avoiding the problem, such as by the trickery of calling Christianity what is in fact its exact antithesis and then giving thanks to God for the great favor of being Christians. As Kierkegaard says, nothing displeases or revolts us, revolts us, he puts it, than the New Testament Christianity when it is properly proclaimed. It can neither win millions of Christians nor bring revenues and earthly profits. Confusion results. If people are to agree, what is proclaimed to them must be to their taste and must seduce them. Here is the difficulty. It is not at all that of showing that official Christianity is not Christianity of the New Testament, but that of showing that New Testament Christianity and what it implies to be a Christian are profoundly disagreeable to us, all of us. Never, no more today than in the year 30, can Christian revelation please us. In the depths of our hearts, Christianity has always been a mortal enemy. History bears witness that in generation after generation, there has been a highly respected social class, that of priests, whose task it is to make of Christianity the very opposite of what it really is. Up to this point, we have been tracing the contours of this subversion. We have looked at history, but we have not yet come to the heart of the problem. It is not the question of how, but of why. So far, we have been trying to answer analytically the question how the revelation of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jesus Christ, that is, how the Gospels, could produce a Christianity that is so far and so different from its origin. In effect, explanations of a sociological order could not take us beyond this how. Within the course of the history, there is no point where one can fix on the why. One might suspect that at the heart of the sociological movement, there is some sinister machination, some invisible hand, some hidden demon. Nothing enables us to answer unless we pass to another plane, the spiritual plane to which we shall in fact return. For the moment, however, we must keep to what we can, what can be established. If we ask why things happened as they did, we cannot give a global or collective answer. We have to consider the relation between revelation and the ordinary folk to whom it is addressed. A tragic chord is struck. We might have had the impression that the X, of which we spoke at the outset, has been the victim of a frightful conspiracy. X meaning, I suppose, his symbol for Christianity as a whole, for the authentic Christianity of the New Testament. A frightful conspiracy that all the world's powers and seductive forces have united to transform this revelation, this work of God, into a banal, conformist, and vulnerable Christianity. We might have been surprised that it did not put up more resistance. This is the point at which to say that if it did not react more vigorously, if the Holy Spirit did not manifest himself in all his grandeur and radiance, if Christians and the church seem to have given in so easily, it is because X was in itself so totally unacceptable, intolerable, unsupportable, and unlivable. And this is not merely in the intellectual sphere, as when Paul arouses mockery by announcing the resurrection to the philosophers of Athens. No, the problem is not that there is difficulty in explaining this revelation, that it contains such mysteries as the virgin birth, the miracles, or the resurrection. Quite the contrary, such factors are, as these are positive and are fully acceptable to average people. Religion and miracle are excellent things. In every age we want religious peace, the assurance of eternal life, pious consolation. We believe in magicians and soothsayers. 
Miracles do not repel us. Only the 19th century and the 50s of our own century took the simplistic view that the age of science has made us rational, that we have come of age, as they put it, so that there is no point in, in talking to us about miracles or resurrections and demythologizing is called for. What ignorance on Boltman's part, he's talking about Rudolf Boltman, the famous Jewish New Testament scholar, I should say German New Testament scholar, who wrote books about the, the mythology of Christianity being dispensed with and had an immense influence in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But Alil says to that, and that was his generation after all, what childishness. The race is always credulous, as is shown by the enormous success of Nostradamus in July 1981. The race is always ready to take mysterious paths, as is shown by the success of the most ridiculous sects during the last 20 years. And he could have said the previous 150 years, said the growth of the cults is exponential since the very age of rationalism took hold in the wake of the Napoleonic period. So we will link to this right away the characteristics of cultic groups, which which videos and PDF we have on hand, but not too many have taken advantage of so far. And next, a little addresses freedom in the spirit versus the intoxication of power and the rigidity of institutions and organizations. Next time.